False religions are composed of three things. Uh, number one, uh, they all contain a holy book or holy books. Uh, and depending on the religion, those holy books or books uh, either are uh, added in addition to the scriptures or they are seen as being uh, superior to the scriptures because the scriptures have all kinds of issues, supposedly speaking. Number two, that's number one. So they have their own holy book or books. Number two, uh, they, be they believe they must have a holy man or man or some kind of guru or somebody who taps into God who's either personal or impersonal, and then they communicate those messages of God to the cultists. Three, uh, they believe salvation or redemption, and they may not exactly use those words, but I'm just using a Christianized version of that, but their view of how you get to see God uh, is based upon the same motif every time, no exception. You believe in God, whoever he or she may be, uh, or God's plural, uh, if you're pantheistic. Uh, and to get into that God's presence, you must do works. Faith plus works. They all are built on the same three components. So it's test time. We test at this church. I just walk around the church, call you by name. Yeah. I will never go back. Um, so false religions composed of three things. Number one, a holy book or books. Number two, holy men uh, who are supposedly speaking for God. And number three, Works, works to be saved, works to be saved. Uh, my last doctoral class I took before I uh, finished my doctorate in apologetics uh, with Dr. Geisler. Uh, Dr. Geisler, by the way, is coming here in October to speak. Uh, he's 85 years old. His son, David, who's an also professor, uh, is coming. You will not want to miss him. He's, in my estimation, he's who, he's who trained Ravi Zacharias. Yeah, so when I speak with Ravi Zacharias at the, Ash, the National Apologetics Conference in October, uh, we were both trained by Dr. Geisler. Uh, who is the epitome of an apologist. Um, so I took a class uh, to finish up my doctorate, uh, and uh, part of the class was on Hinduism. So my last church, I had a lot of people in my church who were former Hindus who converted to Christ. And uh, we had many interesting discussions. Um, and that's a whole another story in and of itself. But I never studied the system completely as, we, when you take a doctor class, you have to study all the original source material, read all the writings. So I read all, the, all their holy books and things. And it was very, very eye-opening. Uh, but uh, basically, here's how Hinduism works. Uh, man's problem is not sin. Uh, it is the lack of knowledge that you are divine. And when you are enlightened as to who you are in your divinity status, uh, you reach a state of enlightenment or you merge with Brahman, who's the impersonal God. Mm. That's basically salvation which is diametrically opposed to Christianity. But that, that's what they believe. Uh, they believe the world around you uh, that you see is what they call maya. Uh, it, is, it is an illusion. It's not really there. Now, as a side point, which is not part of my sermon, but if you think about the notion of the premise that everything around me is an illusion, um, how can you make the assertion that everything is an illusion because you have said that my position within this illusion is not an illusion to tell you it's an illusion? And I don't say that to be funny. I say that to show you it's self-defeating as an argument, is it not? It doesn't consistently fly. And um, because it doesn't consistently fly and it's self-defeating, it's not truth. But it's very deceptive. Uh, to get enlightened, how do you do that? Well, to get enlightened, you must do three things. Uh, you must do uh, what is called karma marga, which is actions and rituals will lead you to a, a ceremonies to a place of enlightenment. Number two, uh, jhana marga is the way of knowledge and meditation. So you can dispel your ignorance of the fact that you don't realize you are of divine status through meditation and tapping into the Brahman, the impersonal God. Three, uh, you must uh, commit to uh, what is called bhakti marga or the way of devotion involving all kinds of public and private acts of worship. Do those three things on your multiple cycles of birth and rebirth, and eventually, hopefully, you merge with your deity status and, and, uh, and have reached a point of, of salvation. You know, I have a lot of Hindus, as I told you at my last class. One 70-year-old uh, 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 Hindu man uh, at my last church, uh, Satya Narayan was his name, uh, came to me after a Bible study in my home one night for new, new members, and this is what he told me on my doorstep when everyone walked away. He said, could I talk to you in private? And I said, sure. And he said, I have a question as a Hindu. I go, yes, what? He said, I have served thousands of gods in my lifetime. And he said, as an old man, I am tired. <laughs> That's what he told me. I said, why are you tired, Satya? He goes, I cannot please them all. He said, I please one over here. I offend a thousand more over here. He said, could we go back in your house and you talk to me about Jesus? Oh, oh let me think about it. <laughs> So we went back in the house, Satya Narayan, he was about 72 at the time, trusted Christ. 
Amen. trusted Christ. Amen. And then he summarily died. His seven brothers blamed me. <laughs> they did. And they ran the temple. They, and his last wish was that I would do the funeral. This is, this is not even part of my sermon notes, but I feel led to tell you. So, sorry. You know, so they, they, all the brothers came to my office at the church. I mean, if they could have taken me out, they would have. I could feel the hate. Uh, but I was, I was his last wish. And I did the funeral. And, and um, it, was, um, it was an interesting funeral. Uh, and he had led all the family from Fiji. Now they're doctors, attorneys, real estate developers, very wealthy family. Sato was a very s simple man. And um, he was the one who came to the United States from Fiji first. So in his funeral, this is what I said. I t and hundreds of these, of the Hindus there of the family, uh, driving Mercedes and Beamers and everything. And I said, you guys are all wealthy because of this one man. He blazed a trail from Fiji to the United States when he was poor. But I said, the greatest thing he did in life was he blazed a trail to the cross of Christ. Ah, That's what I told them. Amen. Yeah. And then I left quickly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, I had to tell them. I had to tell him. See, that, that, that's what Paul's doing to the Romans. He's telling them, you know, you believe in concepts like what a Hindu might believe, and they're erroneous. They're erroneous, and you can't get saved on that stuff. And for me, at that funeral, I had people who got saved from that funeral who said, I, I want to do what Satya did. I want to go to the cross. And it was awesome. I brought one of my friends who was uh, converted, who uh, was a Hindu, who became a Christian, who was a pastor to Hindus, uh, converted. And I brought him with me, set him on the front row with me to help coach me as to what to anticipate at the funeral. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't ready to their culture, and he taught me much. But, I mean, you've got to get out there and mix it up and then speak in love and truth. And that's, you know, that's what I'm doing. I'm telling you, if you believe this, this is erroneous. It's self-defeating as a system even in and of itself. See, this is what Paul's doing to the Romans. He's telling them as he writes this letter, you Jews who believe that you've got to be saved by the works of the law plus coupled with the, uh, the belief in God, if you believe that notion, I used to believe that until I ran into the risen Savior, Jesus. Amen. He said, I changed my paradigm when that happened. So in Romans 3.23, by way of review, here's what Paul tells those who would uh, be believe you've got to be saved by your works. He says in verse 23, by way of review, for all have sinned, Jew and Gentile, and because of that, the result is you fall short of the glory of God. You can't achieve his glory. He says being justified is a legal term, uh, declared righteous in God's storeroom, room, comes by what means? What's he saying? It's a gift. It's a gift. Did you get that? It's a gift. It's not something I work for. God gives salvation to me. Uh, this came by his grace. Through, notice the preposition, through tells you the means by which you get this. The very limited. Christianity is very narrow. I'll be the first to tell you. Yeah, it's narrow. It's narrow. It comes by God's grace through, by means of, the redemption, which is, and there's another preposition, in Christ Jesus. And in no other. Amen. That's it. That's it. Salvation. Justification only in Christ. How does a person get into God's presence? Through multiple births and rebirths, and hopefully I do enough good karma, it overrides the bad karma, and I finally uh, observe the three paths of enlightenment, I finally merge with the Brahmin, and woo! Is that, is that what I do? No, Paul says, no, that, that's erroneous. See, he's going to tell you, as he's going to tell the Jews, uh, you're not saved by works, you're saved by faith. And that's the whole chapter. We're, we want to dig into the main motif of the chapter. We introduced it last week, I'll introduce it again, because you might have forgotten the main idea, Right? It's been seven days, right? What's the main idea of this passage? Justification by faith. It's not by works. It's God's timeless story of salvation. It's throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. I got my, both my uh, degrees in the Old Testament. Why? Because I was so fascinated at the New Testament story. I knew I couldn't understand the New Testament story unless I really understand the foundation of that in the Old Testament. What do you find out in the Old Testament? God saves people not based on works but on faith. So Paul's going to validate that point like a good attorney by uh, developing several Socratic points where he's going to pose questions to the Jews at the Roman church to help them move from a false paradigm of salvation to the true. So we want to review, uh, in case you weren't here last Sunday. We, the first point we covered last week as this, this timeless story is seen in the life of Abraham and David. So how did, how did Abraham, the progenitor of the, of the Jewish nation, how did he become a believer? Was it by works or by faith? Paul's argument is faith. Because before he became a Jew, what was he? Well, there were no Jews. So what was he? You read the story? It's in Genesis. Yeah. Oh, this spiritual world right here. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was a Chaldean. Who were the Chaldees? He's like a, you know, an ancient area like, or like before Iraq was there. 
So, you know, God calls him, and we don't know from Scripture how God called him, but he got the message from God somewhere that God wanted him to go 600 miles across the desert to a land he had never seen before to then be uh, the progenitor of a, of a nation that would bless the world because the Messiah would come through him. He was 75 years old. As I said last week, most 75 years old, if God came to you and said, I got a job for you to do, get on a camel, ride 600 miles, you'd be going, hey, I'm in the rest home right now. I mean, there's just no way I can do that. What'd he do? He went. He believed God could use him as an old man to do this, and that faith was a credit to him as righteousness. That's when he got saved, as it were. King David, when he had more sin, sin than you can shake a stick at, when, when God covered his sin, did it come by works or faith? By faith. By faith. God covered his adultery. God covered it, uh, everything. His lying, his murderous ways. He covered everything by, by faith. Now, uh, second point Paul wants to develop. So it's self, this timeless story is seen in Abraham and, 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 and in uh, David. Now he's going to add to that. It's seen also in the limitations of ritual, religious ritual. Uh, I have a friend of mine. He's, uh, I think he's still alive. He was my, one of my dad's U.S. Customs agents. Uh, my dad was the district director, but he worked for my dad many, many years. I grew up with him. Uh, great family, great people, no question. Gets up every morning and washes the statue of Mary by hand, like 5 a.m. Admirable, is it not? Will it save him? No, no, because that's a work. It won't save him. What saves a man? Faith, faith in God's provision to save you, which will be the Christ. So Paul's going to say, hey, I understand religious ritual. I used to be a rabbinical scholar. He says, I understand religious ritual. I, you name it, I did it. Rosh Hashanah, whatever, pick it. Passover, Peshach, pick it. I did it. I realized it didn't save me. So that's going to be his argument in verses 9 through 12. Notice what he says. Now, these, these sentences, they're Pauline sentences, so they're kind of long and complex. So you'll read them, and they're kind of sentences where you walk away, and you're going to ask yourself, if you're honest, what did he just say? Okay, so we'll come back and explain it. So is this blessing of salvation by grace through the Abrahamic covenant? Uh, this, is this blessing then on the circumcised, which would be the Jew? Or is it on the uncircumcised Gentile also? Uh, notice the Socratic question. It says, for we say, uh, as Jews, uh, quoting from the Old Testament, uh, this would be Genesis chapter 15, I think verse 6, uh, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. The moment he believed that God would use him as an old man, 75-year-old man, give him a son at 75 uh, to bless the world through the son's messianic line, uh, the day he believed that, God said, you are a righteous man. It wasn't a work. It says, how then was it credited? Well, while he was circumcised... Or when he was uncircumcised. It's a chronological argument. It says not while he was circumcised, but while he was uncircumcised. He had received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had while he was uncircumcised, so that, the reason for all of this, so that he might be the father of all, Jew and Gentile, who do what? Who believe. Who believe. Without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. Uh, the implication is at the moment of faith. And the father of circumcision of those who not only are of the circumcision, the Jews, but also of those who in, follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while he was uncircumcised. See what I told you? What is he talking about? <laughs> was, I, was I lying? No, that's complicated. But really what he's saying is, it's a chronologic argument. Abraham, our father, had great faith. That made him saved. But, but did he believe in a ritual, religious ritual to be saved? Well, the ritual is circumcision. And he says, Does, did the circumcision save him? No, because he was accredited as a righteous man before that. Well, how long before that? Well, if God called him at 75 and he doesn't get circumcised until he's 99, you got a calculator? I don't have a phone with me right now. You do the math. Mathematicians here, our church is full of them. It's, you didn't even look at anything, did you? You just knew. It's 24 years. So for those 24 years before Abraham was circumcised, according to God's command, was he saved? Yes. yes, he was. So the ritual didn't save him. Now, Paul's going to try to open up this meaning to people lost in thinking ritual saves you uh, by asking questions. Uh, he probably got this from Socratic notions. Uh, because when you ask questions, uh, uh, it's a better way to speak to somebody. Like if I'm speaking to a non-Christian and I only use definitive statements to speak with them, um, 
that's probably going to wind up in a debate, in a, in a heated discussion. But if I'm listening to them speak, and I'm merely taking their statements and, and state, stating questions, well-aimed questions to them, it's causing them to do what? They got to speak. See, they're on the defense. So if they're the Hindu explaining to me, oh, everything is it's just an illusion. Really? It, just answer one question. How can it be an illusion if you're assuming your statement's not an illusion? Oh, you see what I mean? You're just coming up with a well-trained question. Uh, there's a lot of times when I talk to non-Christians, and I've been talking to them my whole life, and I used to be one too. Um, <laughs> I mean, I actually sit down with a piece of paper when I'm done talking to them, and I take down notes of what I could have said better. Or write down questions. I should have asked him this. Uh, ask the Spirit. He'll teach you. So Paul's saying, let me ask you some questions about uh, the, the, uh, uh, Abraham. His, when did he get saved? Well, long before. 24 years before uh, he was circumcised. I don't know if you've read, uh, if you like to read uh, pseudepigraphic books. Okay, you don't. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Jewish books, uh, pseudepigraphic, pseudo meaning uh, false, and grapho, the Greek word meaning to write, false writings that were not accepted in the, in the canon. Uh, but there's a book called Ju Jubilees, a Jewish book. Here's what it says in chapter 15, verse 25. It says that this law is of uh, circumcision is for all generations forever. There is no circumcision of the days, no omission of one day out of the eight days, for it is an eternal ordinance to be circumcised. Why? Uh, it's ordained and it's written, they say, in heavenly tablets. And everyone that is born of the flesh, of, whose foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day, belongs not to the children of the covenant. I, I'd say that's pretty precise, doesn't it? So you have to have this ritual as a male to be saved. If you do not have this ritual, you're not saved. Paul's problem with that is, it wasn't applicable to Abraham. How was he saved? Not like that. So if you're a Jew, you're going to be asking Paul a question. It's a very simple, logical question. Where did circumcision come from? If you're the Jew, you'd be saying to Paul, hey, have you forgotten where it came from? Did it come from God? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. But it wasn't mandated for part of salvation. It was just a sign of the covenant. That's all it was. It was an outer sign that you're a Jewish man, part of the covenant of God. It didn't save you. That's why it came many, many years later. Like 24 years later is when he actually circum became circumcised. Why did God set it up that way? I mean, why did God wait so long in Abraham's life? Uh, verse 11 uh, it has an infinitive clause that gives you the reason why God set it up this way. Uh, the, in English, it says, so that. That's an infinitive clause in Greek. Um, he says, he set it up this way so that he might be the father of all who believe uh, without being circumcised, the Gentile, me, a goy, or a goyim, uh, that righteousness not, might be credited to them. God purposely set up it this way so that Jews and Gentiles could come to him on the same terms, grace and faith. Aren't you glad he came that way and not by ritual? Because if you did it by ritual, you'd be thinking to yourself, have I done enough? You would be like Satya on my front porch who said to me, I am tired. Tired. That's one of the most amazing things I think I have ever heard from an art Christian. Honest confession. So do rituals save? No. No. Uh, he's going to say, gonna, then say in verses 13 to 70, 17, the, the timeless nature of the gospel story is not related to the Mosaic law. Now you have to stop and ask yourself, has he talked about the limitations of the Mosaic law in chapters 1 to 3 so far? Have you been here with me? Are you all new? This is the first Sunday. He's talked about it before multiple times. He keeps talking about the limitations of the law. I mean, is Paul just redundant? N no, because what does Paul know? If you believe in salvation by faith plus works, it's very hard not to believe in that. Why? A lot of reasons. Uh, one of them would be superstition. You know, hey, I got this from my mom and dad who got this ritual and law stuff from their parents. It's passed down through generations. And if I choose salvation by grace, I am going to disrespect my entire family line. I, I'm not going to do that. Oh, really? I've had these conversations with people. The, and Paul says, let me talk about how hard it is to break free from the law, but you need to because the law doesn't save you. So verse 13, this is a long sentence, so hang with me. You promise? Good. You're still holding on to that pseudepigraphic word, but just move on. Uh, verse 13. For the promise to Abraham, uh, the unconditional covenant, or to his descendants that he would be the heir of the world was not through the law. It's not how he got it. But, notice the contrast, but through righteousness of faith. Now he's going to set up a conditional clause. 
He's a, he would make a great attorney. Here's, here's what he's going to say. He says, consider this scenario. He says, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. Why? Well, if I got to work for it, it's not a promise. So he said, if you consider your system as a Jew, your system is self-defeating. Verse 15, for the law brings about wrath, but there, where there is no law, there is no violation. I mean, think about the law. What is the, the, what, the law brings about wrath. I mean, we talked about this last week. We need to talk about it again because Paul's talking about it again because he knows it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. I got to get away from thinking the law saves me. All the law does is tell you if you do not do what the law says, you're a criminal. 55 miles an hour, 56 is. Bring it along. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean really, you know, uh, but, but it's breaking the law. So at, at my last, uh, first house that Liz and I purchased in California, there was a huge lot behind our house. Several, I don't know how many acres it was, seven, eight acres. And it had been dirt forever because uh, I'd been in and out of Stockton f for most of my life until I finally got married and moved there. So I, I, I've seen this lot and uh, no trash on it, no, uh, no plants or anything. It's a big giant dirt lot. Then they built a massive Home Depot there right behind my house. Yeah, when they opened it the first night, it was a Friday night. I was looking at Liz on the couch, and I looked over at her and I said, hey, babe, uh, you know, what do you want to do tonight? She goes, I don't know. I said, hey, let's just, it was like a two-minute walk, you know. I said, you want to go, like, walk around the tool corral? Anyway, that, did, that didn't go well. Back to my sermon. <laughs> Guys say dumb things, don't they? <laughs> Haven't you? I have. Anyway, back to my sermon. Before the developer developed it, he, he sunk a got a whole post hole digger, dug a hole, sunk a four by four, eight foot post in there, poured in, you know, some, you know, quick, quick crete, set it up, and hung a little tiny sign there. Here's what the sign said. No dumping, penal code, blah, blah, blah. No dumping. Guess what happened? It's California. Hey, man, you can't be putting laws, man. I don't like signs. I don't like laws. When I see laws, man, I do the opposite. Somebody took their big truck, backed it up to the sign, and buried the sign in trash. <laughs> That's, that person needs to go to church. I mean, unbelievable. So that, can that sign that law help that person that has a major issue in being rebellious? No. It can just say if you dumped your trash here or anywhere on the slot, it's, it's criminal. Paul's saying, hey, I used to believe the law saved you, but now I understand the law can't save me because you can never do enough to please the law. You get, what did Satya say? Tired. Tired. Paul's so smart. He says, for this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, Jew and Gentile, not only to those who are of the law, the Jew, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. And he says, as it, as it is written, a father of many nations in the Old Testament, have I made you uh, in the presence of him who he believed, Abraham believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Here's an old man, 75 years old. God says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Uh, his name, Abraham, means the father of many. If you're working for him and he's 75 and he tells you, I am the father of many, <laughs> what are you probably going to be thinking as a field hand? Mm -hmm. He's 79. Does he have a son? I don't see a son. He's the father of many? Huh? You know? Uh, and, and he's, you know, getting in his 80s. Does he have any children? No. He's the father of many. Well, in his own mind, he is, you know. And then he finally blows it. Remember, Hagar comes along. His wife says, hey, honey, you know, I'm in my 80s. I can't have children. God promised you a child. Use Hagar. She's younger. Was that a good thing? Uh, no. No, that wasn't the promised child. And so God says at 86 years old, when he blows it, uh, the promised son's still coming. He makes him wait 13 years for Isaac. God ever make you wait? Made him wait till he's a hundred before Isaac's born. If you're a field hand, you're still thinking to yourself, why'd they name him Abraham, father of the many? I don't see the many. Well, then what did God do? God said, I'm going to wait till you're a hundred years old and I'm going to give you Isaac, whose name means what? Laughter. Laughter. If you were a hundred and your wife was like 98 and you had a child, would you not be doing that? <laughs> You got to warm the milk up. You got to change the diapers. You know, you know what I'm saying? Have you had a child? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, we had Nathan, uh, my junior year at Dallas Seminary, uh, you know, and I was into my six year Greek uh, and um, I was sitting in this, uh, this class at 745 in the morning. I'd been up all night with him screaming, crying, and, and the board was moving. The Greek was moving. 
And I'm, like, I'm sitting on the front row trying to stay awake. But I've been up all night, pacifier, milk, and diapers, the whole shebang. So I went home one day and I told Liz, Liz, why do people have children? <laughs> you know, it's like, I was so tired. You know what I mean? Could you, I was in my 20s. Could you imagine a hundred? A hundred. No. God says uh, Abraham was not saved based upon uh, any observance of the law. He just flat out believed if God can raise the dead, he can take my dead 99-year-old body and my wife too and give us a child. Is that faith or what? Which leads to the next point. It's a nice segue. I didn't plan it that way, but (laughs) it's not based on the law. It's based on faith. What kind of faith? The faith that Abraham had. What kind of faith did he have? Verse 17. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he believed, Abraham believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, i.e. Isaac, in he in hope, against hope he believed. Remember how old was he? 99. Talk about hope. He believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which has been spoken as God had promised him, so shall your descendants be. God said, I'm going to give you descendants as the sand of the sea. So without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. Would you not at 99? And your friends would too. Now as good as, I love this. this if you tell me scripture is boring, you haven't read it. He looked at his body and he said, I am as good as dead. <laughs> you know, since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not what? waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in the faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was going to perform it. Perform what? Do the impossible. Give a couple in their late 90s a child who would become the child of millions of people and ultimately the child that would bring in the Messiah, Jesus. You want to talk about faith? Uh, If you want to get saved, you have to have, have the faith of Abraham. What kind of faith did he have? Faith that God could do the impossible. What is salvation? The fact that God could take you, me, a sinner, and wipe your slate clean at the moment of faith, not works, and give you eternal life and forgiveness and make you his son, make you his daughter at that precise moment. The faith that believes that is the faith of Abraham. God, you can do the impossible. God took a 72-year-old former Hindu, Satya Narayan. And what did God do for Satya in my living room? He took that man who was tired of ritual, tired of law, and he said, tell me about Jesus. And what happened that moment? Well, he inherited salvation. And not many months after that, walked into God's presence. Amazing. Verse 22 says, when you think about what Abraham did, his faith, his unwavering faith, Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. When he believed God could do the impossible to give him a child, that faith was what ushered him into God's presence. It's the same faith in Jesus that ushers you into God's presence, that he can do the impossible. This is what Paul gets to in verse 23 as we close. It says, not only for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake, my sake, your sake. So we could read the story to whom it will also be credited as to those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions, not his, and was raised because of our justification. See, Abraham only had a faint view of the one who was to come. Remember, Jesus said in John 8, 58, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. That's when they tried to crucify Christ. Why? Because he has said to the Jews when they asked them, who are you? And he says to them, I am ego imi, ego imi, I am. I am, emphatic in Greek. Go back and read the construction in the Old Testament. I have. The construction in the Old Testament's uh, the ego we me, I, I am, of the burning bush, God, the ontological, all, eternal one. The statements, that when this is made in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, it's ani, who? It's I am in Hebrew. Where do you find those? Used exclusively of God Almighty. Who was Jesus? God Almighty. What he do? He died for our sins and was raised from the day, dead the third day. That changes everything because when you believe that he can take you a dead sinner and make you an alive saint, when you believe that beyond what the world might say, you get saved. Here's the, here's the amazing facets of his mission. We'll click through these. Number one, his son left glory so that we, we might do what? Have the prospects of glory. You know, I, when I told my sister goodbye, 
for the last time, two days after, you know, right before Easter. And she died from ovarian cancer. When I kissed her goodbye for the last time, hard, I don't know, one of the hard things I've ever had to do. But this is what she got. Glory. She's probably wondering what I'm crying about. <laughs> Glory. Uh, he, who, she saw Satya because she knew Satya. Uh, his son came down so that we could go up. Because see, I couldn't go up into heaven unless he descended. That's amazing. Uh, his son bore our sin on the cross so we don't have to bear our sin anymore. Uh, his son died physically so we could live spiritually. His son rose from the grave so we could have life and rise to life. That's unbelievable. But God gives you that unimaginable thing at the moment of faith. I grew up in a Baptist church singing hymns. I told you this last Sunday. I'm ordained Southern Baptist pastor. I don't know how that happened. It, wasn't, it was not my game plan. <laughs> but that's who gave me my job first. And that's who ordained me. We used to sing hymns. Here's an old hymn we used to sing. I will sing of my Redeemer of his wondrous love to me. Wow. On the cruel cross he suffered. From the curse he set me free. Second verse, I will tell the wondrous story, my lost state to save in boundless love and mercy. He the ransom freely gave. I love the chorus. O sing, O sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon. He paid my debt and he set me free. I believe that. Do you believe that? Because if you believe that work by faith, you are his child. If that is uh, not true of you today, um, all you have to do is say, God, I don't understand half of what Marty said, but I get the fact I'm a sinner and I can't work myself into your presence. Save me. This day he shall. He hears that cry. And if you've got friends and family locked in false systems, mince no words, but speak in love and tell them the truth of the work of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the wonder of the cross of Jesus Christ set sinners free from sin, I being one of those. We give you thanks for the, the wonder of salvation. It is a gift. We don't have to work for it. Perhaps we've been walking with you so long we forgot about the wonder of that salvation. Re renew in us the joy of our salvation, that first love. And we have many among us, I'm sure, that don't know you. Might this be the day when they, in the quietness of a moment, say, God, that, that was speaking right to me. Save me this day and you shall. We now, as your saints, humbly lay our tithes and offerings at your feet. That's just a form of worship to say, God, we love you so much. We support your kingdom work. Bless that work in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.